Chapter Seven of the Flirt by Booth Tarkington. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Toward four o'clock that afternoon, a very thin, fair young man shakily heaved himself into a hammock under the trees in that broad back yard wherein, as Valentine Corliss had yesterday noticed, the last iron monarch of the herd, with unabated arrogance, had entered domestic service as a clothes prop. The young man, who was of delicate appearance and unhumanly pale, stretched himself at full length on his back, closed his eyes, moaned feebly, cursed the heat in a stricken whisper. Then, as a locust directly overhead violently shattered the silence, and seemed like to continue the outrage for ever, the shaken lounger stopped his ears with his fingers and addressed the insect in old Saxon. A white-jacketed mulatto came from the house bearing something on a silver tray. "'Julep, Mist Vilas?' he said sympathetically. Ray Vilas rustily manoeuvred into a sitting position, and, with eyes still closed, made shift to accept the julep in both hands, drained half of it, opened his eyes, and thanked the cup-bearer feebly, in a voice and accent reminiscent of the melodious South. "'And I wonder,' he added, "'if you can tell me. "'I'm Miss William Lindley's houseman, Joe Vaxton's,' said the mulatto, in the tone of an indulgent nurse. "'You in Miss Lindley's back yard right now, sitting in a hammock.' "'I seem to gather almost that much for myself,' returned the patient. "'But I should like to know how I got here.' "'Jess came out the front door and walked round the house and sat down. Mr. Richard had to go downtown. Told me not to wake you. But I heard you splashin' in the bath, and you told me you didn't want no breakfast. Yes, Joe, I'm aware of what's occurred since I awoke, said Vilas, and, throwing away the straws, finished the julep at one draught. What I want to know is how I happen to be here at Mr. Lindley's. Mr. Richard brought you last night, sir. I don't know where he got you, but I heard a considerable thrash him round, up and down the house, and so I come help him get you to bed in one of them spare rooms." Joe chuckled ingratiatingly. "'Lord name! You certainly wasn't asking for no bed!' He took the glass, and the young man reclined again in the hammock, a hot blush vanquishing his pallor. "'Was I, was I very bad, Joe?' "'Oh, you was all right.' Joe hastened to reassure him. You was just only a little bit tight. Did it really seem only a little? The other asked hopefully. Yes, sir, said Joe promptly. Nothing at all. You just wanted to rear round a little bit. Miss Richard took gun away from you. What? Oh, I told him you wasn't going to use it. Joe laughed. But you so wild be didn't know what you do. You certainly was drunkest man I see in long while," he said admiringly. You pert near had us both wore out for you give up, and Miss Richard and me, we used to handlin drunken man too, used to have big times week in, week out, if missed will. That's Miss Richard's brother, you know, sir, what died a whiskey. He laughed again in high good humour. You certainly laid it all over any of them old times we had with missed will. Mr. Vilas shifted his position in the hammock uneasily. Joe's honest intentions to be of cheer to the sufferer were not wholly successful. "'I told Miss Richard,' the kindly servitor continued, "'it was a mighty good thing his ma gone up north endurin' the hot spell. Since Miss Will die, she can't hardly bear to see drunken man around the house. Miss Richard hardly ever tetch nothin' himself no more. You go and feel better, sir, out in the fresh air," he concluded, comfortingly, as he moved away. "'Joe!' "'Yes, sir?' Mr. Vilas pulled himself upright for a moment. "'What use in the world do you reckon one julep is to me?' "'Miss Richard say to give you one drink if you ask for it, sir,' answered Joe, looking troubled. "'Well, you've told me enough now about last night to make any man hang himself and I'm beginning to remember enough more." "'Pshaw, Miss Vilas,' the coloured man interrupted deprecatingly. "'You didn't broke nothing. You only had a couple glass wine too much. You didn't make no trouble at all. Just went right off to bed. 
You ought to see some of them old times me and Mist Richard used to have with Mist Will. Joe. Yes, sir. I want three more juleps, and I want them right away. The troubled expression upon the colored man's face deepened. Mist Richard says just one, sir, he said reluctantly. I'm afraid. Joe. Yes, sir. I don't know, said Ray Vilas slowly, whether or not you ever heard that I was born and raised in Kentucky. Yes, sir, returned Joe humbly. I heard so. Well, then, said the young man in a quiet voice, you go and get me three juleps. I'll settle it with Mr. Richard. Yes, sir. But it was with a fifth of these renovators that Lindley found his guest occupied an hour later, while upon a small table nearby a sixth, untouched, awaited disposal beside an emptied coffee-cup. Also Mr. Vilas was smoking a cigarette with unshadowed pleasure. His eye was bright, his expression carefree, and he was sitting up in the hammock, swinging cheerfully, and singing the Marseillaise. Richard approached through the yard, coming from the street without entering the house, and anxiety was manifest in the glance he threw at the green-topped glass upon the table, and in his greeting. "'Hail, Gloom!' returned Mr. Vilas cordially, and, observing the anxious glance, he swiftly removed the untouched goblet from the table to his own immediate possession. Two simultaneous juleps will enhance the higher welfare,' he explained airily. Sir, your Mr. Varden was induced to place a somewhat larger order with us than he protested to be your intention. Trusting you to exonerate him from all so-and-so and that these words, etc., he depleted the elder glass of its liquor, waved it in the air, cried, Health, host, and set it upon the table. I believe I do not err in assuming my cup-bearer's name to be Varden, although he himself, in his simple Americo-Africanism, is pleased to pluralize it. Do I fret you, host?" "'Not in the least,' said Richard, dropping upon a rustic bench, and beginning to fan himself with his straw hat. "'What's the use of fretting about a boy who hasn't sense enough to fret about himself?' "'Boy?' Mr. Vilas affected puzzlement. "'Do I hear all right?' sir do you boy me bethink you i am now the shell of five mint juleps plus and am pot valiant and is this mere capacity itself to be lightly boyed again do i not wear a man's garment a man's garnitures heed your answer for this serge these flannels and these silks are yours and though i may not fill them to the utmost i do to the longmost precisely I am the stature of a man. Had it not been for your razor, I should wear the beard of a man. Therefore I'll not be boyed. What have you to say in defence? Hadn't you better let me get Joe to bring you something to eat? asked Richard. Eat? Mr. Vilas disposed of the suggestion with mournful hauteur. There, for the once I forgive you. Let the subject never be mentioned between us again we will tactfully turn to a topic of interest. My memories of last evening, at first hazy and somewhat disconcerting, now merely amuse me. Following the pleasant Spanish custom, I went a serenading, but was kidnapped from beneath the precious casement by, by a zealous arrival. Host, zealous arrival is not the julep in action. It is a triumph of paraphrase. I wish you'd let Joe take you back to bed," said Richard. "'Always bent on thoughts of the flesh,' observed the other sadly. "'Beds are for bodies, and I am become a thing of spirit. My soul is grateful a little for your care of its casing. You behold, I am generous. I am able to thank my successor to Carmen.' Lindley's back stiffened. "'Velas! Spare me your protests the younger man waved his hand languidly. "'You wish not to confer upon this subject?' "'It's a subject we'll omit,' said Richard. His companion stopped swinging, allowed the hammock to come to rest. His air of badinage fell from him. For the moment he seemed entirely sober, and he spoke with gentleness. "'Mr. Lindley, if you please, I'm still a gentleman—at times.' 
"'I beg your pardon,' said Richard quickly. "'No need of that.' The speaker's former careless and boisterous manner instantly resumed possession. "'You must permit me to speak of a wholly fictitious lady, a creature of my wanton fancy, sir, whom I call Carmen. It will enable me to relieve my burdened soul of some remarks I have long wished to address to your excellent self.' "'Oh, all right,' muttered Richard, much annoyed. "'Let us imagine,' continued Mr. Vilas, beginning to swing again, that I thought I had won this Carmen." Lindley uttered an exclamation, shifted his position in his chair, and fixed a bored attention upon the passing vehicles in the glimpse of the street afforded between the house and the shrubberies along the side fence. The other, without appearing to note his annoyance, went on cheerfully. "'She was a precocious huntress. Early in youth she passed through the accumulator stage, leaving it to the crude or village belle to rejoice in numbers and the excitement of teasing cubs in the bear pit. It is the nature of this imagined Carmen to play fiercely with one imitation of love after another. A man thinks he wins her, but it is merely that she has chosen him for a while. And Carmen can have what she chooses. If the man exists who could show her that she cannot, she would follow him through the devil's dance but neither you nor I would be that man, my dear sir. We assume that Carmen's eyes have been mine, her heart is another matter, and that she has grown weary of my somewhat Sicilian manner of looking into them, and following her nature and the law of periodicity, which Carmen's must bow to, she seeks a cooler gaze, and calls Mr. Richard Lindley to come and take a turn at looking. Now Mr. Richard Lindley is straight as a die. He will not even show that he hears the call until he is sure that I have been dismissed. Therefore, I have no quarrel with him. Also, I cannot even hate him, for in my clearer julep vision I see that he is but an interregnum. Let me not offend, my friend. Chagrin is to be his, as it is mine. I was a strong draught, he but the quieting potion our Carmen took to settle it. We shall be brothers in woe some day nothing in the universe lasts except hell life is running water love a looking-glass death an empty theatre that reminds me as you are not listening i will sing he finished his drink and lifted his voice hilariously the heavenly stars far above her the wind of the infinite sea who knows all her perfidy love her so why call it madness in me ah why call it madness he set his glass with a crash upon the table staring over his companion's shoulder what if you please is the royal exile who thus seeks refuge in our hermitage his host had already observed the approaching visitor with some surprise and none too graciously it was valentine corliss he had turned in from the street and was crossing the lawn to join the two young men Lindley rose, and, greeting him with sufficient cordiality, introduced Mr. Vilas, who bestowed upon the newcomer a very lively interest. "'You are as welcome, Mr. Corliss,' said this previous guest, earnestly, "'as if these sylvan shades were mine. I hail you, not only for your own sake, but because your presence encourages a hope that our host may offer refreshment to the entire company.' Corliss smilingly declined to be a party to this diplomacy, and seated himself beside Richard Lindley on the bench. "'Then I relapse!' exclaimed Mr. Vilas, throwing himself back full length in the hammock. "'I am not replete, but content. I shall meditate. Gentlemen, speak on!' He waved his hand in a gracious gesture, indicating his intention to remain silent, and lay quiet, his eyes fixed steadfastly upon Corliss. "'I was coming to call on you,' said the latter to Lindley, "'but I saw you from the street, and thought you mightn't mind my being as informal as I used to be so many years ago.' "'Of course,' said Richard. "'I have a sinister purpose in coming,' Mr. Corliss laughingly went on. "'I want to bore you a little first, and then make your fortune. No doubt that's an old story to you.' 
but I happen to be one of the adventurers whose argosies are laden with real cargoes. Nobody knows who has or hasn't money to invest nowadays, and of course I've no means of knowing whether you have or not. You see what a direct chap I am. But if you have, or can lay hold of some, I can show you how to make it bring you an immense deal more." Naturally, said Richard pleasantly, I shall be glad if you can do that. Then I'll come to the point. It is exceedingly simple. That's certainly one attractive thing about it. Corliss took some papers and unmounted photographs from his pocket, and began to spread them open on the bench between himself and Richard. No doubt you know southern Italy as well as I do. Oh, I don't know it. I've been to Naples, down to Paestum, drove from Salerno to Sorrentobi Amalfi, but that was years ago. Here's a large-scale map that will refresh your memory. He unfolded it and laid it across their knees. It was frayed with wear along the folds, and had been heavily marked and dotted with red and blue pencillings. My millions are in this large irregular section, he continued. It's the ankle-bone and instep of Italy's boot. This sizable province called Basilicata, east of Salerno, north of Calabria. And I'll not hang fire on the point, Lindley. What I've got there is oil. Olives? asked Richard, puzzled. Hardly! Corliss laughed. Though, of course, one doesn't connect petroleum with the thought of Italy, and of all Italy, southern Italy. But in spite of the years I've lived there, I've discovered myself to be so essentially American and commercial that I want to drench the surface of that antique soil with the brown, bad-smelling crude oil that lies so deep beneath it. Basilicata is the coming great oil field of the world, and that's my secret. I dare to tell it here, as I shouldn't dare in Naples. Shouldn't dare? Richard repeated, with growing interest, and no doubt having some vague expectation of a tale of the Camorra. To him Naples had always seemed of all cities the most elusive and incomprehensible, a laughing, thieving, begging, mandolin-playing, music-and-murder-haunted metropolis, about which anything was plausible and this impression was not unique, as no inconsiderable proportion of Mr. Lindley's fellow-countrymen share it, a fact thoroughly comprehended by the returned native. "'It isn't a case of not daring on account of any bodily danger,' explained Corliss. "'No,' Richard smiled reminiscently. "'I don't believe that would have much weight with you if it were. You certainly showed no symptoms of that sort in your extreme youth. I remember you had the name of being about the most daring and foolhardy boy in town. I grew up to be cautious enough in business, though, said the other, shaking his head gravely. I haven't been able to afford not being careful. He adjusted the map, a prefatory gesture. Now, I'll make this whole affair perfectly clear to you. It's a simple matter, as are most big things. I'll begin by telling you of Moliterno. He's been my most intimate friend in that part of the continent for a great many years, since I went there as a boy, in fact. He sketched a portrait of his friend, Prince Moliterno, bachelor chief of a historic house, the soul of honour, land poor, owning leagues and leagues of land, hills and mountains, broken towers and ruins, in central Basilicata, a province described as wild country and rough, off the rails, and not easy to reach. Moliterno and the narrator had gone there to shoot. Corliss had seen surface oil upon the streams and pools. He recalled the discovery of oil near his own boyhood home in America, had talked of it to Moliterno, and both men had become more and more interested, then excited. They decided to sink a well. Corliss described picturesquely the difficulties of this enterprise, the hardships and disappointments how they dragged the big tools over the mountains by mule-power, how they had kept it all secret, how he and Moliterno had done everything with the help of peasant labourers and one experienced man, who had seen service in the Persian oil-fields. He gave the business reality, colouring it with details relevant and irrelevant, anecdotes and wayside incidents. He was fluent, elaborate, explicit throughout. They sank five wells, he said, at the angles of this irregular pentagon you see here on the map, outlined in blue. 
these red circles are the wells four of the wells came in tremendous but they had managed to get them sealed after wasting he was sorry to think how many thousand barrels of oil the fifth well was so enormous that they had not been able to seal it at the time of the speaker's departure for america but i had a cablegram this morning he added letting me know they've managed to do it at last here is the cablegram he handed richard a form signed antonio moliterno now to go back to what i said about not daring to speak of this in naples he continued smiling the fear is financial not physical the knowledge of the lucky strike he explained must be kept from the neapolitan money sharks a third of the land so rich in oil already belonged to the moliterno estates but it was necessary to obtain possession of the other two-thirds before the secret leaks into naples so far it was safe the peasants of basilicata being as medieval a lot as one could wish he related that these peasants thought that the devils hiding inside the mountains had been stabbed by the drills and that the oil was devil's blood you can see some of the country people hanging about staring at a well in this kodak though it's not a very good one he put into richard's hand a small blurred photograph showing a spouting well with an indistinct crowd standing in an irregular semicircle before it is this the basilicatan peasant costume asked richard indicating a figure in the foreground the only one revealed at all definitely it looks more oriental isn't the man wearing a fez let me see responded mr corliss very quickly perhaps i gave you the wrong picture <laughs> oh no he laughed easily holding the kodak closer to his eyes that's all right it is a fez that's old salviati our engineer the man i spoke of who'd worked in persia you know he's always worn a fez since then got in the habit of it out there and says he'll never give it up moliterno's always chaffing him about it he's a faithful old chap salviati i see lindley looked thoughtfully at the picture which the other carelessly returned to his hand there seems to be a lot of oil there it's one of the smaller wells at that and you can see from the kodak that it's just blowing not an eruption from being shot or the people wouldn't stand so near yes there's an ocean of oil under that whole province but we want a lot of money to get at it it's mountain country our wells will all have to go over fifteen hundred feet and that's expensive we want to pipe the oil to salerno where the standards ships will take it from us and it will need a great deal for that but most of all we want money to get hold of the land we must control the whole field and it's big how did you happen to come here to finance it i was getting to that moliterno himself is as honourable a man as breathes god's air but my experience has been that neapolitan capitalists are about the cleverest and slipperiest financiers in the world we could have financed it twenty times over in naples in a day but neither moliterno nor i was willing to trust them the thing is enormous you see a really colossal fortune and italian law is full of ins and outs and the first man we talked to confidentially would have given us his word to play straight and the instant we left him would have flown post haste for basilicata and grabbed for himself the two-thirds of the field not yet in our hands moliterno and i talked it over many many times we thought of going to rome for the money to paris to london to new york but i happened to remember the old house here that my aunt had left me i wanted to sell it to add whatever it brought to the money i've already put in and then it struck me i might raise the rest here as well as anywhere else the other nodded i understand i suppose you'll think me rather sentimental corliss went on with a laugh which unexpectedly betrayed a little shyness i've never forgotten that i was born here was a boy here in all my wanderings i've always really thought of this as home his voice trembled slightly and his face flushed he smiled deprecatingly as though in apology for these symptoms of emotion and at that both listeners felt perhaps with surprise the man's strong attraction there was something very engaging about him 
in the frankness of his look, and in the slight tremor in his voice. There was something appealing and yet manly in the confession, by this thoroughgoing cosmopolite, of his real feeling for the home town. Of course I know how very few people, even among the old citizens, would have any recollection whatever of me, he went on, but that doesn't make any difference in my sentiment for the place and its people. That street out yonder was named for my grandfather. There's a statue of my great-uncle in the State House yard. All my own blood. Belonged here, and though I have been a wanderer and may not be remembered, naturally am not remembered, yet the name is honoured here, and I... I... He faltered again, then concluded with quiet earnestness. I thought that if my good luck was destined to bring fortunes to others, it might as well be to my own kind, that at least I'd offer them the chance before I offered it to anyone else. He turned and looked Richard in the face. That's why I'm here, Mr. Lindley. The other impulsively put out his hand. I understand, he said heartily. Thank you. Corliss changed his tone for one less serious. You've listened very patiently, and I hope you'll be rewarded for it. Certainly you will, if you decide to come in with us. May I leave the maps and descriptions with you? Yes, indeed. I'll look them over carefully, and have another talk with you about it. Thank heaven that's over! exclaimed the lounger in the hammock, who had not once removed his fascinated stare from the expressive face of Valentine Corliss. If you have now concluded with dull care, allow me to put a vital question. Mr. Corliss, do you sing? The gentleman addressed favoured him with a quizzical glance from between half-closed lids, and probably checking an impulse to remark that he happened to know that his questioner sometimes sang, replied merely, No. It is a pity. Why? Nothing, returned the other inconsequently. It just struck me that you ought to sing the Toreador song. Richard Lindley, placing the notes and maps in his pocket, dropped them, and, stooping, began to gather the scattered papers with a very red face. Corliss, however, laughed good-naturedly. "'That's most flattering,' he said, "'though there are other things in Carmen I prefer, probably because one doesn't hear them so eternally.' Vilas pulled himself up to a sitting position and began to swing again. "'Observe our host, Mr. Corliss,' he commanded gaily. "'He is a kind old Dobbin, much beloved, but cares damn little to hear you or me speak of music.' He'd even rather discuss your oil business than listen to us talk of women, whereas nothing except women ever really interests you, my dear sir. He's not our kind of man, he concluded mournfully, not at all our kind of man. I hope, Corliss suggested, he's going to be my kind of man in the development of these oil fields. How ridic— Mr. Vilas triumphed over the word after a slight struggle. Ulus. I shall review that. Ridiculous of you to pretend to be interested in oil fields. You are not that sort of person, whatever. Nothing could be clearer than that you would never waste the time demanded by fields of oil. Groundlings call this the mechanical age, a vulgar error. My dear sir, you and I know that it is the age of woman. Even poets have begun to see that she is alive. Formerly we did not speak of her at all but of late years she has become such a scandal that she is getting talked about. Even our dramas, which used to be all blood, have become all flesh. I wish I were dead, but will continue my harangue because the thought is pellucid. Women selecting men to mate with are of only two kinds, just as there are but two kinds of children in a toy shop. One child sets its fancy on one partic— The orator paused, then continued— on one certain toy, and will make a distressing scene if she doesn't get it. She will have that one. She will go straight to it, clasp it and keep it. She won't have any other. The other kind of woman is to be understood if you will make the experiment of taking the other kind of child to a toy shop, and telling her you will buy her any toy in the place, but that you will buy her only one. If you do this in the morning, she will still be in the shop when it is closing for the night, because, though she runs to each toy in turn with excitement and delight, she sees another over her shoulder, 
and the one she has not touched is always her choice, until she has touched it. Some get broken in the handling. For my part, my wires are working rather rustily, but I must obey the stage manager. For my requiem, I wish somebody would ask them to play Gounod's masterpiece. What's that? asked Corliss, amused. The funeral march of a marionette. I suppose you mean that for a cheerful way of announcing that you are a fatalist. Fatalism? That is only a word, declared Mr. Vilas gravely. If I am not a puppet, then I am a god. Somehow I do not seem to be a god. If a god is a god, one thinks he would know it himself. I now yield the floor. Thanking you cordially, I believe there is a lady walking yonder who commands salutation. He rose to his feet, bowing profoundly. Cora Madison was passing, strolling rather briskly down the street, not in the direction of her home. She waved her parasol with careless gaiety to the trio under the trees, and, going on, was lost to their sight. "'Hello!' exclaimed Corliss, looking at his watch with a start of surprise. "'I have two letters to write for the evening mail. I must be off.' At this Ray Vila's eyes, still fixed upon him, as they had been throughout the visit, opened to their fullest capacity in a gaze of only partially alcoholic wildness. Entirely aware of this singular glare, but not in the least disconcerted by it, the recipient proffered his easy farewells. "'I had no idea it was so late. Good afternoon, Mr. Vilas. I have been delighted with your diagnosis. Lindley, I'm at your disposal when you've looked over my data. My very warm thanks for your patience, and adio. Lindley looked after him as he strode quickly away across the green lawn, turning, at the street, in the direction Cora had taken, and the troubled Richard felt his heart sink with vague but miserable apprehension. There was a gasp of desperation beside him, and the sound of Ray Vilas's lips parting and closing with little noises of pain. "'So he knows her,' said the boy, his thin body shaking. "'Look at him! Damn him! See his deep chest, that conqueror's walk, the easy, confident, male pride of him, a true-born natural rake, the Toreador all over. His agitation passed suddenly. He broke into a loud laugh, and flung a reckless hand to his companion's shoulder. "'You good old fool!' he cried. "'You'll never play Don Jose!' End of chapter 7「Chapter Eight of the Flirt by Booth Tarkington. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Hedrick Madison, like too many other people, had never thought seriously about the moon, nor ever had he encouraged it to become his familiar, and he underwent his first experience of its incomparable betrayals one brilliant night during the last week of that hot month. The preface to this romantic evening was substantial and prosaic four times during dinner was he copiously replenished with hash, which occasioned so rich a surfeit within him that, upon conclusion of the meal, he found himself in no condition to retort appropriately to a solicitous warning from Cora to keep away from the cat. Indeed, it was half an hour later, and he was sitting, to his own consciousness too heavily, upon the back fence, when belated inspiration arrived but there is no sound where there is no ear to hear, and no repartee, alas, when the wretch who said the first part has gone, so that Cora remained unscathed, as from his alley solitude Hedrick hurled in the teeth of the rising moon these bitter words, "'Oh, no! Our cat only eats soft meat!' He renewed a morbid silence, and the moon, with its customary deliberation, swung clear of a sweeping branch of the big elm in the front yard, and shone full upon him. Nothing warned the faded youth not to sit there. No shadow of imminent catastrophe tinted that brightness. No angel whisper came to him, bidding him be gone, and to go in a hurry and as far as possible. No, 
He sat upon the fence, an inoffensive lad, and, except for still feeling his hash somewhat, and a gradual dispersing rancour concerning the cat, at peace. It is for such lulled mortals that the ever-lurking furies save their most hideous surprises. Chin on palms, he looked idly at the moon, and the moon inscrutably returned his stare. Plausible, bright, bland, it gave no sign that it was at its awful work. For the bride of night is like a car-dealer whose fingers move so swiftly through the pack the trickery goes unseen. This moon, upon which he was placidly gazing, because he had nothing else to do, betokened naught to Hedrick. To him it was the moon of any other night, the old moon, certainly no moon of his delight. Withal, it may never be gazed upon so fixedly and so protractedly, no matter how languidly, with entire impunity. That light breeds a bug in the brain. Who can deny how the moon wrought this thing under the hair of unconscious Hedrick, or doubt its responsibility for the thing that happened? "'Little boy!' It was a very soft, small voice, silky and queer, and at first Hedrick had little suspicion that it could be addressing him. The most rigid self-analysis could have revealed to him no possibility of his fitting so ignominious a description. "'Oh, little boy!' He looked over his shoulder and saw, standing in the alley behind him, a girl of about his own age. She was daintily dressed, and had beautiful hair, which was all shining in pale gold. "'Little boy!' She was smiling up at him, and once more she used that wantonly inaccurate vocative, "'Little boy!' Hedrick grunted unencouragingly, "'Who you calling little boy?' For reply she began to climb the fence. It was high, but the young lady was astonishingly agile, and not even to be deterred by several faint wails from tearing and ripping fabrics, casualties which appeared to be entirely beneath her notice. Arriving at the top rather dishevelled, and with irregular pennons here and there flung to the breeze from her attire, she seated herself cosily beside the dumbfounded Hedrick. She turned her face to him and smiled and there was something about her smile which Hedrick did not like. It discomforted him, nothing more. In sunlight he would have had better the chance to comprehend, but unhappily this was moonshine. "'Kiss me, little boy,' she said. "'I won't!' exclaimed the shocked and indignant Hedrick, edging uneasily away from her. "'Let's play,' she said cheerfully. "'Play what?' I like chickens. Do you know I like chickens?" The rather singular lack of connection in her remarks struck him as a misplaced effort at humour. "'You're having lots of fun with me, aren't you?' he growled. She instantly moved close to him, and lifted her face to his. "'Kiss me, darling little boy,' she said. There was something more than uncommonly queer about this stranger an unearthliness of which he was confusedly perceptive, but she was not without a curious kind of prettiness, and her pale gold hair was beautiful. The doomed lad saw the moon shining through it. "'Kiss me, darling little boy,' she repeated. His head whirled. For the moment she seemed divine. George Washington used profanity at the Battle of Monmouth. Hedrick kissed her. He instantly pushed her away with strong distaste. "'There,' he said angrily, "'I hope that'll satisfy you.' He belonged to his sex. "'Kiss me some more, darling little boy,' she cried, and flung her arms about him. With a smothered shout of dismay he tried to push her off, and they fell from the fence together into the yard, at the cost of further and almost fatal injuries to the lady's apparel. Hedrick was first upon his feet. "'Haven't you got any sense?' he demanded. She smiled unwaveringly, rose, without assistance, and repeated, "'Kiss me some more, darling little boy.' "'No, I won't. I wouldn't for a thousand dollars.' Apparently she did not consider this discouraging. She began to advance endearingly, while he retreated backward. "'Kiss me some—' "'I won't, I tell you.' Hedrick kept stepping away, moving in a desperate circle. He resorted to a brutal formula. "'You make me sick!' 
kiss me some more darling lit i won't he bellowed and if you say that again i'll kiss me some more darling little boy she flung herself at him and with a yell of terror he turned and ran at top speed she pursued laughing sweetly and calling loudly as she ran kiss me some more darling little boy kiss me some more darling little boy the stricken hedrick knew not whither to direct his flight he dared not dash for the street with this imminent tattered incubus she was almost upon him and he frantically made for the kitchen door only to swerve with a gasp of despair as his foot touched the step for she was at his heels and he was sickeningly assured she would cheerfully follow him through the house shouting that damning refrain for all ears a strangling fear took him by the throat if cora should come to be a spectator of this unspeakable flight if cora should hear that horrid plea for love then farewell peace indeed farewell all joy in life for ever panting sobbingly he ducked under the amorous vampire's arm and fled on he zigzagged desperately to and fro across the broad empty back yard a small hand ever and anon managing to clutch his shoulder the awful petition in his ears kiss me some more darling little boy hedrick emerging from the kitchen door laura stood and gazed in wonder as the two eerie figures sped by her circled ducked dodged flew madly on this commonplace prelieu was become the scene of a witch chase the moonlight fell upon the ghastly flitting face of the pursued uplifted in agony white wet with fey eyes also it illumined the unreal elf following close a breeze-blown fantasy in rags kiss me some more darling little boy laura uttered a sharp exclamation stand still hedrick she called you must hedrick made a piteous effort to increase his speed it's lolita martin called laura she must have her way or nothing can be done with her stand still hedrick had never heard of lolita martin but the added information concerning her was not ineffective it operated as a spur and laura joined the hunt stand still she cried to the wretched quarry she's run away she must be taken home stop hedrick you must stop hedrick had no intention of stopping but laura was a runner and as he dodged the other caught and held him fast the next instant lolita laughing happily flung her arms around his neck from behind let me go shuddered hedrick let me go kiss me again darl i woof he became inarticulate she isn't right his sister whispered hurriedly in his ear she has spells when she's weak mentally you must be kind to her she only wants you to only he echoed hoarsely i won't ki he was unable to finish the word we must get her home said laura anxiously will you come with me lolita dear apparently lolita had no consciousness whatever of laura's presence instead of replying she tightened her grasp upon hedrick and warmly reiterated her request shut up you parrot hissed the goaded boy perhaps she'll go if you let her walk with her arms around your neck suggested laura if i what let's try it we've got to get her home her mother must be frantic about her come let's see if she'll go with us that way with convincing earnestness hedrick refused to make the experiment until laura suggested that he remain with lolita while she summoned assistance then as no alternative appeared his spirit broke utterly and he consented to the trial stipulating with a last burst of vehemence that the process of the unthinkable pageant should be through the alley come lolita said laura coaxingly we're going for a nice walk at the adjective hedrick's burdened shoulders were racked with a brief spasm which recurred as his sister added your darling little boy will let you keep hold of him lolita seemed content laughing gaily she offered no opposition but maintaining her embrace with both arms and walking somewhat sideways went willingly enough 
and the three slowly crossed the yard, passed through the empty stable, and out into the alley. When they reached the cross street at the alley's upper end, Hedrick balked flatly. Laura expostulated, then entreated. Hedrick refused with sincere loathing to be seen upon the street occupying his present position in the group. Laura assured him that there was no one to see. He replied that the moon was bright and the evening early. He would die, and readily, but he would not set foot in the street. Unfortunately, he had selected an unfavourable spot for argument. They were already within a yard or two of the street and a strange boy, passing, stopped and observed, and whistled discourteously. "'Ain't he the spooner?' remarked this unknown, with hideous admiration. "'I'll thank you,' returned Hedrick haughtily, "'to go on about your own business.' "'Kiss me some more, darling little boy,' said Lolita. The strange boy squawked, wailed, screamed with laughter, howled the loving petition in a dozen keys of mockery, while Hedrick writhed and Lolita clung. Enriched by a new and great experience, the torturer trotted on, leaving viperous cachinations in his wake. But the martyrdom was at an end. A woman, hurrying past, bareheaded, was greeted by a cry of delight from Lolita, who released Hedrick and ran to her with outstretched arms. "'We were bringing her home, Mrs. Martin,' said Laura reassuringly. "'She's all right. Nothing's the matter except that her dress got torn. We found her playing in our yard.' "'I thank you a thousand times, Miss Madison,' cried Lolita's mother, and flutteringly plunged into a description of her anxiety, her search for Lolita, and concluded with renewed expressions of gratitude for the child's safe return, an outpouring of thankfulness and joy wholly incomprehensible to Hedrick. "'Not at all,' said Laura cheerfully. "'Come, Hedrick, we'll go home by the street, I think.' She touched his shoulder, and he went with her in stunned obedience. He was not able to face the incredible thing that had happened to him. He walked in a trance of horror. "'Poor little girl,' said Laura gently, with what seemed to her brother an indefensible misplaced compassion. Usually they have her live in an institution for people afflicted as she is, but they brought her home for a visit last week, I believe. Of course you didn't understand, but I think you should have been more thoughtful. Really, you shouldn't have flirted with her." Hedrick stopped short. Flirted! His voice was beginning to show symptoms of changing this year. It rose to a falsetto wail, flickered, and went out. With the departure of Lolita in safety, what had seemed bizarre and piteous became obscured, and another aspect of the adventure was presented to Laura. The sufferings of the arrogant are not wholly depressing to the spectator, and of arrogance Hedrick had ever been a master. She began to shake, a convulsion took her, and suddenly she sat upon the curbstone without dignity, and laughed as he had never seen her. A horrid distrust of her rose within him. He began to realize in what plight he stood, what terrors o'erhung. "'Look here,' he said miserably, "'are you, you aren't, you don't have to go and, and talk about this, do you?' "'No, Hedrick,' she responded, rising and controlling herself somewhat. "'Not so long as you're good.' This was no reassuring answer. "'And politer to Cora she added. Seemingly he heard the lash of a slave-whip crack in the air. The future grew dark. "'I know you'll try,' she said, and the unhappy lad felt that her assurance was justified. But she had not concluded the sentence. "'Darling little boy,' she capped it, choking slightly. "'No other little girl ever fell in love with you, did there, Hedrick?' she asked and receiving an incoherent but furious reply, she was again overcome, so that she must lean against the fence to recover. "'It seems so, so curious,' she explained, gasping, "'that the first one, the, the only one, should be an, uh, an—' She was unable to continue. Hedrick's distrust became painfully increased. He began to feel that he disliked Laura. She was still wiping her eyes, and subject to recurrent outbursts, 
when they reached their own abode and as he bitterly flung himself into a chair upon the vacant front porch he heard her stifling an attack as she mounted the stairs to her own room he swung the chair about with its back to the street and sat facing the wall he saw nothing there are profundities in the abyss which reveal no glimpse of the sky presently he heard his father coughing near by and the sound was hateful because it seemed secure and unshamed it was a cough of moral superiority and just then the son would have liked to believe that his parents boyhood had been one of degradation as complete as his own but no one with this comfortable cough could ever have plumbed such depths his imagination refused the picture he was bitterly certain that mr madison had never kissed an idiot hedrick had a dread that his father might speak to him he was in no condition for light conversation but mr madison was unaware of his son's near presence and continued upon his purposeless way he was smoking his one nightly cigar and enjoying the moonlight he drifted out toward the sidewalk and was accosted by a passing acquaintance a comfortable burgess of sixty leading a child of six or seven by the hand out taking the air are you mr madison said the pedestrian pausing yes just trying to cool off returned the other how are you prior anyway i haven't seen you for a long time not since last summer said prior i only get here once or twice a year to see my married daughter i always try to spend august with her if i can she's still living in that little house over on the next street i bought for her through your real estate company i suppose you're still in the same business yes pretty slack these days i suppose so i suppose so responded mr pryor nodding summer i suppose it usually is well i don't know when i'll be going out on the road again myself business is pretty slack all over the country this year let's see i've forgotten said madison ruminatively you travel don't you for a new york house affirmed mr pryor he did not however mention his line yes sir he added merely as a decoration and then said briskly i see you have a fine family mr madison yes sir a fine family i've passed here several times lately and i've noticed em fine family let's see you've got four haven't you three said madison two girls and a boy well sir that's mighty nice observed mr pryor mighty nice i only have my one daughter and of course me living in new york when i'm at home and her here why i don't get to see much of her you got both your daughters living with you haven't you yes right here at home let's see neither of em's married i believe no not yet seems to me now said pryor taking off his glasses and wiping them seems to me i did hear somebody say one of em was going to be married engaged maybe no said madison not that i know of well i suppose you'd be the first to know yes sir and both men laughed their appreciation of this folly they're mighty good-looking girls that's certain continued mr pryor and one of em's as fine a dresser as you'll meet this side of the rue de la paix you mean in paris asked madison slightly surprised at this allusion you've been over there pryor oh sometimes was the response my business takes me over now and then i think it's one of your daughters i've noticed dresses so well isn't one of em a mighty pretty girl about twenty-one or two with a fine head of hair sort of lightish brown beautiful figure and carries a white parasol with a green lining sometimes yes that's cora i guess pretty name too said pryor approvingly yes sir i saw her going into a florist's downtown the other day with a fine-looking young fellow i can't think of his name let's see my daughter was with me and she'd heard his name said his family used to be big people in this town and oh said madison young corliss corliss exclaimed mr pryor with satisfaction that's it corliss well sir he chuckled from the way he was looking at your miss cora 
It struck me he seemed kind of anxious for her name to be Corliss, too. Well, hardly I expect, said the other. They just barely know each other. He's only been here a few weeks. They haven't had time to get much acquainted, you see. I suppose not, agreed Mr. Pryor, with perfect readiness. I suppose not. I bet he tries all he can to get acquainted, though. He looked pretty smart to me. Doesn't he come about as often as the law allows? I shouldn't be surprised, said Madison indifferently. He doesn't know many people about here any more, and it's lonesome for him at the hotel. But I guess he comes to see the whole family. I left him in the library a little while ago, talking to my wife. That's the way. Get around the old folks first. Mr. Pryor chuckled cordially. Then, in a mildly inquisitive tone, he said, "'Seems to be a fine square young fellow, I expect?' "'Yes, I think so.' "'Pretty name, Cora,' said Pryor. "'What's this little girl's name?' Mr. Madison indicated the child, who had stood with heroic patience throughout the incomprehensible dialogue. "'Lottie, for her mother. She's a good little girl.' "'She is so.' "'I've got a young son she ought to know,' remarked Mr. Madison serenely, with an elderly father's total unconsciousness of the bridgeless gap between seven and thirteen. "'He'd like to play with her. I'll call him.' "'I expect we'd better be getting on,' said Pryor. "'It's near Lottie's bedtime. We just came out for our evening walk.' "'Well, he can come and shake hands with her anyway,' urged Hedrick's father. Then they'll know each other, and they can play some other time. He turned toward the house and called loudly, Hedrick! There was no response. Behind the back of his chair, Hedrick could not be seen. He was still sitting immovable, his eyes torpidly fixed upon the wall. Hedrick! Silence. Oh, Hedrick! shouted his father. Come out here! I want you to meet a little girl! Come and see a nice little girl. Mr. Pryor's grandchild was denied the pleasure. At the ghastly words, little girl, Hedrick dropped from his chair flat upon the floor, crawled to the end of the porch, wriggled through the railing, and immersed himself in deep shadow against the side of the house. Here he removed his shoes, noiselessly mounted to the sill of one of the library windows, then reconnoitred through a slit in the blinds before entering. The gas burned low in the drop-light, almost too dimly to reveal the two people upon a sofa across the room. It was a faint murmur from one of them that caused Hedrick to pause and peer more sharply. They were Cora and Corliss. He was bending close to her. Her face was lifting to his. "'Ah, kiss me, kiss me,' she whispered. Hedrick dropped from the sill, climbed through a window of the kitchen, hurried up the back stairs, and reached his own apartment in time to be violently ill in seclusion. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of The Flirt by Booth Tarkington This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Villages are scattered plentifully over the unstable buttresses of Vesuvius, and the inhabitants sleep at night. Why not? Quite unaware that he was much of their condition, Mr. Madison bade his incidental gossip and the tiny Lottie good night, and sought his early bed. He maintained in good faith that Saturday night was a great night to sleep, because of the later hour for rising, probably having also some factitious conviction that there prevailed a hushed preparative of the Sabbath. As a matter of fact, in summer the other members of his family always looked uncommonly haggard at the Sunday breakfast table. Accepting without question his preposterous legend of additional matutinal slumber, they postponed retiring to a late hour, and were awakened simultaneously with thousands of fellow-sufferers at about half after five on Sunday morning by a journalistic uprising. Over the town, in these early hours, rampaged the small vendors of the manifold sheets, local papers and papers from greater cities, hawker succeeding hawker, with yell upon yell and brain-piercing shrillings in unbearable cadences. No good burger ever complained. 
the people bore it as in winter they bore the smoke that injured their health ruined their linen spoiled their complexions forbade all hope of beauty and comfort in their city and destroyed the sweetness of their homes and of their wives it is an incredibly patient citizenry and exalts its persecutors of the madison family cora probably suffered most and this was the time when it was no advantage to have the front bedroom she had not slept until close upon dawn and the hawkers woke her irreparably she could but rage upon her hot pillow by and by there came a token that another anguish kept company with hers she had left the door open for a better circulation of the warm and languid air and from hedrick's room issued an oof of agonized disgust cora little suspected that the youth reeked not of newsboys hedrick's miseries were introspective the cries from the street were interminable each howler in turn heard faintly in the distance then in crescendo until he had passed and another succeeded him and all the while cora lay tossing and whispering between clenched teeth having ample reason that morning to prefer sleep to thinking sleep was impossible but she fought for it she did not easily surrender what she wanted and she struggled on with closed eyes long after she had heard the others go down to breakfast about a hundred yards from her windows to the rear were the open windows of a church which fronted the next street and stood dos a dos to the dwelling of the madisons the sunday school hour had been advanced for the hot weather and partly on this account and partly because of the summer absence of many families the attendants were few but the young voices were conducted rather than accompanied in pious melody by a cornetist who worthily thought to amend in his single person what lack of volume this paucity occasioned he was a slender young man in hot black clothes he wore the unfacaded collar fatally and unanimously adopted by all adam's apple men of morals he was washed fair flat-skulled clean-minded and industrious and the only noise of any kind he ever made in the world was on sunday precious jewels sweet jewels the jams of his crown sang the little voices feebly they were almost unheard but the young man helped them out figuratively he put them out and the cornet was heard it was heard for blocks and blocks it was heard over all that part of the town in the vicinity of the church it was the only thing that could be heard in his daily walk this cornetist had no enemies he was kind-hearted he would not have shot a mad dog he gladly nursed the sick he sat upon the platform before the children he swelled perspired and blew and felt that it was a good blowing if other thoughts vapoured upon the borders of his mind they were of the dinner he would eat soon after noon at the house of one of the frilled white muslin teachers he was serene his eyes were not blasted his heart was not instantly withered his thin bluish hair did not fall from his head his limbs were not detached from his torso yet these misfortunes had been desired for him with comprehension and sincerity at the first flat blat of his brassy horn it is impossible to imagine the state of mind of this young cornetist could he have known that he had caused the prettiest girl in town to jump violently out of bed with what petitions upon her lips regarding his present whereabouts and future detention it happened that during the course of his sunday walk on corliss street that very afternoon he saw her was hard smitten by her beauty and for weeks thereafter laid unsuccessful plans to meet her her image was imprinted he talked about her to his boarding-house friends and office acquaintances his favourite description being the sweetest-looking lady i ever laid eyes on cora descending to the breakfast-table rather white herself was not unpleasantly shocked by the haggard aspect of hedrick who with laura and mrs madison still lingered good morning cora he said politely and while she stared in suspicious surprise he passed her a plate of toast with ostentatious courtesy 
but before she could take one of the slices wait he said it's very nice toast but i'm afraid it isn't hot i'll take it to the kitchen and have it warmed for you and he took the plate and went out walking softly cora turned to her mother appalled he'll be sick she said mrs madison shook her head and smiled sadly he helped to wait on all of us he must have been doing something awful more likely he wants permission to do something awful laura looked out of the window there cora said hedrick kindly when he brought the toast you'll find that nice and hot she regarded him steadfastly but with modesty he avoided her eye you wouldn't make such a radical change in your nature hedrick she said with a puzzled frown just to get out of going to church would you i don't want to get out of going to church he said he gulped slightly i like church and church time found him marching decorously beside his father the three ladies forming a rear rank a small company in the very thin procession of fanning women and mopping men whose destination was the greystone church at the foot of corliss street the locusts railed overhead hedrick looked neither to the right nor to the left they passed a club of which a lower window was vacated simultaneously with their coming into view and a small but ornate figure in pale grey hurried down the steps and attached itself to the second row of madisons good morning said mr wade trumbull thought i'd take a look in at church this morning myself care of this encumbrance was usually expected of laura and mrs madison but to their surprise cora offered a sprightly rejoinder and presently dropped behind them with mr trumbull mr trumbull was also surprised and as naively pleased what's happened he asked with cheerful frankness you haven't given me a chance to talk to you for a long while haven't i she smiled enigmatically i don't think you've tried very hard this was too careless it did not quite serve even for trumbull what's up he asked not without shrewdness is richard lindley out of town i don't know i see perhaps it's this new chap corliss has he left what nonsense what have they got to do with my being nice to you she gave him a dangerous smile and it wrought upon him visibly don't you ever be nice to me unless you mean it he said feebly cora looked grave and sweet she seemed mysteriously moved i never do anything i don't mean she said in a low voice which thrilled the little man this was machine work easy and accurate cora he began breathlessly there she exclaimed shifting on the instant to a lively brusqueness that's enough for you just now we're on our way to church trumbull felt almost that she had accepted him have you got your penny for the contribution box she smiled i suppose you really give a great deal to the church i hear you're richer and richer i do pretty well he returned coolly you can know just how well if you like not on sunday she laughed then went on admiringly i hear you're very dashing in your speculations then you've heard wrong because i don't speculate he returned i'm not a gambler except on certainties i guess i disappointed a friend of yours the other day because i wouldn't back him on a thousand to one shot who was that she asked with an expression entirely veiled corliss he came to see me wanted me to put real money into an oil scheme too thin why is it too thin she asked carelessly too far away for one thing somewhere in italy anybody who would put up his cash would have to do it on corliss's bare word that he struck oil well she turned her face to him and a faint perturbation was manifest in her tone isn't mr corliss's bare word supposed to be perfectly good oh i suppose so but i don't know he isn't known here nobody really knows anything about him except that he was born here besides i wouldn't make an investment on my own father's bare word 
if he happened to be alive. Perhaps not, Cora spoke impulsively, a sudden anger getting the best of her, but she controlled it immediately. Of course I don't mean that, she laughed sweetly, but I happen to think Mr. Corliss's scheme a very handsome one, and I want my friends to make their fortunes, of course. Richard Lindley and Papa are going into it. I'll bet they don't, said Trumbull promptly. Lindley told me he'd look it over and couldn't see his way to. He did? Cora stiffened perceptibly and bit her lip. Trumbull began to laugh. This is funny, you trying to talk business. So Corliss has been telling you about it? Yes, he has, and I understand it perfectly. I think there's an enormous fortune in it, and you'd better not laugh at me. A woman's instinct about such things is better than a man's experience sometimes. You'll find neither Lindley nor your father are going to think so, he returned sceptically. She gave him a deep sweet look. But I mustn't be disappointed in you, she said, with the suggestion of a tremor in her voice. Whatever they do, you'll take my advice, won't you, Wade? I'll take your advice in anything but business. He shook his head ominously. And wouldn't you take my advice in business? she asked, very slowly and significantly. Under any circumstances? You mean, he said huskily, if you were my wife? She looked away and slightly inclined her head. No, he answered doggedly, I wouldn't. You know mighty well that's what I want you to be, and I'd give my soul for the tip of your shoe. But business is an entirely different matter, and I... Wade, she said, with wonderful and thrilling sweetness. They had reached the church. Hedrick and his father had entered. Mrs. Madison and Laura were waiting on the steps. Cora and Trumbull came to a stop some yards away. Wade, I... I want you to go into this. Can't do it, he said stubbornly. If you ever make up your mind to marry me, I'll spend all the money you like on you. But you'll have to keep to the woman's side of the house. You make it pretty hard for me to be nice to you, she returned and the tremor now more evident in her voice was perfectly genuine. "'You positively refuse to do this, for me?' "'Yes, I do. I wouldn't buy sight unseen to please God Almighty, Cora Madison.' He looked at her shrewdly, struck by a sudden thought. "'Did Corliss ask you to try and get me in?' "'He did not,' she responded icily. "'Your refusal is final?' "'Certainly.' He struck the pavement a smart rap with his walking stick. By George, I believe he did ask you. That spoils church for me this morning. I'll not go in. When you quit playing games, let me know. You needn't try to work me any more, because I won't stand for it. But if you ever get tired of playing, come and tell me so. He uttered a bark of rueful laughter. Ha! I must say that gentleman has an interesting way of combining business with pleasure. Under favourable circumstances, the blow Cora dealt him might have been physically more violent. Good morning, she laughed gaily. I'm not bothering much about Mr. Corliss's oil in Italy. I had a bet with Laura I could keep you from saying, I beg to differ, or talking about the weather for five minutes. She'll have to pay me. Then, still laughing, she lowered her parasol, and with superb impudence brushed it smartly across his face, turned on her heel, and, red with fury, joined her mother and sister, and went into the church. The service failed to occupy her attention. She had much in her thoughts to distract her. Nevertheless, she bestowed some wonderment upon the devotion with which her brother observed each ceremonial rite. He joined in prayer with real fervour. He sang earnestly and loudly. A great appeal sounded in his changing voice, and, during the sermon, he sat with his eyes upon the minister in a stricken fixity. All this was so remarkable that Cora could not choose but ponder upon it, and, observing Hedrick furtively, she caught, if not a clue itself, at least a glimpse of one. She saw Laura's clear profile becoming subtly agitated 
then noticed a shimmer of Laura's dark eye as it wandered to Hedrick, and so swiftly away it seemed not to dare to remain. Cora was quick. She perceived that Laura was repressing a constant desire to laugh and that she feared to look at Hedrick lest it overwhelm her. So Laura knew what had wrought the miracle. Cora made up her mind to explore this secret passage. When the service was over, and the people were placidly buzzing their way up the aisles, Cora felt herself drawn to look across the church, and following the telepathic impulse, turned her head to encounter the gaze of Ray Vilas. He was ascending the opposite aisle, walking beside Richard Lindley. He looked less pale than usual, though his thinness was so extreme it was like emaciation. But his eyes were clear and quiet, and the look he gave her was strangely gentle. Cora frowned and turned away her head with an air of annoyance. They came near each other in the convergence at the doors, but he made no effort to address her, and, moving away through the crowd as quickly as possible, disappeared. Valentine Corliss was disclosed in the vestibule. He reached her an instant in advance of Mr. Lindley, who had suffered himself to be impeded, and Cora quickly handed the former her parasol, lightly taking his arm. Thus the slow Richard found himself walking beside Laura in a scattered group, its detached portion consisting of his near-betrothed and Corliss. For although the dexterous pair were first to leave the church, they contrived to be passed almost at once, and, assuming the position of trailers, lagged far behind on the homeward way. Laura and Richard walked in the unmitigated glare of the sun. He had taken her black umbrella and conscientiously held it aloft, but over nobody. They walked in silence. They were quiet people, both of them, and Richard, not talkative under any circumstances, never had anything whatever to say to Laura Madison. He had known her for many years, ever since her childhood, seldom indeed formulating or expressing a definite thought about her, though sometimes it was vaguely of his consciousness that she played the piano nicely, and even then her music had taken its place as but a colour of Cora's background. For to him, as to every one else, including Laura, Laura was in nothing her sister's competitor. She was a neutral-tinted figure, taken for granted, obscured, and so near being nobody at all, that, as Richard Lindley walked beside her this morning, he glanced back at the lagging couple and uttered a long and almost sonorous sigh, which he would have been ashamed for anybody to hear, and then actually proceeded on his way without the slightest realization that anybody had heard it. She understood, and she did not disturb the trance. She did nothing to make him observe that she was there. She walked on with head, shoulders, and back scorching in the fierce sun, and allowed him to continue shading the pavement before them with her umbrella. When they reached the house, she gently took the umbrella from him and thanked him, and he mechanically raised his hat. They had walked more than a mile together. He had not spoken a word and he did not even know it. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 of The Flirt by Booth Tarkington This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Dinner on Sunday, the most elaborate feast of the week for the Madisons, was always set for one o'clock in the afternoon, and sometimes began before two but not to-day. The escorts of both daughters remained, and a change of costume by Cora occasioned a long postponement. Justice demands the admission that her reappearance in a glamour of lilac was reward for the delay. Nothing more ravishing was ever seen. She was warrantably informed by the quicker of the two guests, in a moment's whispered tete-a-tete -tete across the banisters as she descended. Another wait followed while she prettily arranged upon the table some dozens of asters from a small garden bed, tilled, planted, and tended by Laura. Meanwhile Mrs. Madison constantly turned the other cheek to the cook. Laura assisted in the pacification. Hedrick froze the ice-cream to an impenetrable solidity. 
and the nominal head of the family sat upon the front porch with the two young men and wiped his wrists and rambled politically till they were summoned to the dining-room cora did the talking for the table she was in high spirits no trace remained of a haggard night there was a bloom upon her she was radiant her gaiety may have had some inspiration in her daring for round her throat she wore a miraculously slender chain of gold and enamel with a pendant of minute pale sapphires scrolled about a rather large and very white diamond laura started when she saw it and involuntarily threw a glance almost of terror at richard lindley but that melancholy and absent-minded gentleman observed neither the glance nor the jewel he saw Cora's eyes, when they were vouchsafed to his vision, and when they were not, he apparently saw nothing at all. With the general exodus from the table, Cora asked Laura to come to the piano and play, a request which brought a snort from Hedrick, who was taken off his guard. Catching Laura's eye, he applied a handkerchief with renewed presence of mind, affecting to have sneezed, and stared searchingly over it at Corliss. He perceived that the man remained unmoved, evidently already informed that it was Laura who was the musician. Cora must be going it pretty fast this time. Such was the form of her brother's deduction. When Laura opened the piano, Richard had taken a seat beside Cora, and Corliss stood leaning in the doorway. The player lost herself in a wandering medley, echoes from Bohème and Pagliacci, then drifted into improvisation and played her heart into it magnificently, a heart released to happiness. The still air of the room filled with wonderful golden sound, a song like the song of a mother flying from earth to a child in the stars, a torrential tenderness, unpent and glorifying in freedom. The flooding, triumphant chords rose, crashed, stopped with a shattering abruptness. Laura's hands fell to her sides, then were raised to her glowing face and concealed it for a moment. She shivered. A quick deep sigh heaved her breast, and she came back to herself like a prisoner leaving a window at the warden's voice. She turned. Cora and Corliss had left the room. Richard was sitting beside a vacant chair, staring helplessly at the open door. If he had been vaguely conscious of Laura's playing, which is possible, certainly he was unaware that it had ceased the others have gone out to the porch she said composedly and rose shan't we join them what he returned blankly i beg your pardon let's go out on the porch with the others no i he got to his feet confusedly i was thinking i believe i'd best be going home not best i think she said not even better i don't see he said his perplexity only increased mr corliss would she retorted quickly come on we'll go and sit with them and she compelled his obedience by preceding him with such a confident assumption that he would follow that he did the fugitive pair were not upon the porch however they were discovered in the shade of a tree behind the house seated upon a rug and occupied in a conversation which would not have disturbed a sick-room. The pursuers came upon them, boldly sat beside them, and Laura began to talk with unwanted fluency to Corliss, but within five minutes found herself alone with Richard Lindley upon the rug. Cora had promised to show Mr. Corliss an old print in the library, so Cora said. Lindley gave the remaining lady a desolate and faintly reproachful look. He was kind, but he was a man, and Laura saw that this last abandonment was being attributed in part to her. She reddened, and, being not an angel, observed with crispness, "'Certainly. You're quite right. It's my fault.' "'What did you say?' he asked vacantly. She looked at him rather fixedly, his own gaze had returned to the angle of the house beyond which the other couple had just disappeared. "'I said,' she answered slowly, "'I thought it wouldn't rain this afternoon.' His wistful eyes absently swept the serene sky, which had been cloudless for several days. "'No, I suppose not,' he murmured. "'Richard,' 
she said with a little sharpness, will you please listen to me for a moment? Oh, what? He was like a diver coming up out of deep water. What did you say? He laughed apologetically. Wasn't I listening? I beg your pardon. What is it, Laura? Why do you let Mr. Corliss take Cora away from you like that? she asked gravely. He doesn't, the young man returned with a rueful shake of the head. Don't you see? It's Cora that goes. Why do you let her, then? He sighed. I don't seem to be able to keep up with Cora, especially when she's punishing me. I couldn't do something she asked me to last night. Invest with Mr. Corliss? asked Laura quickly. Yes, it seemed to trouble her that I couldn't. She's convinced it's a good thing. She thinks it would make a great fortune for us. Us? repeated Laura gently. You mean for you and her, when you're... When we're married, yes, he said thoughtfully. That's the way she stated it. She wanted me to put in all I have. Don't do it, said Laura decidedly. He glanced at her with sharp inquiry. Do you mean you would distrust Mr. Corliss? I wasn't thinking of that. I don't know whether I'd trust him or not. I think I wouldn't. There's something veiled about him, and I don't believe he's an easy man to know. What I meant was that I don't believe it would really be a good thing for you with Cora. It would please her, of course, thinking I deferred so much to her judgment. Don't do it! she said again, impulsively. "'I don't see how I can,' he returned sorrowfully. "'It's my work for all the years since I got out of college, and if I lost it I'd have to begin all over again. It would mean postponing everything. Cora isn't a girl you can ask to share a little salary, and if it were a question of years, perhaps, perhaps Cora might not feel she could wait for me, you see.' He made this explanation with plaintive and boyish sincerity, hesitatingly, and as if pleading a cause. And Laura, after a long look at him, turned away, and in her eyes were actual tears of compassion for the incredible simpleton. "'I see,' she said. "'Perhaps she might not.' "'Of course,' he went on, "'she's fond of having nice things, and she thinks this is a great chance for us to be millionaires.' And then, too, I think she may feel that it would please Mr. Corliss and help to save him from disappointment. She seems to have taken a great fancy to him." Laura glanced at him, but did not speak. "'He is attractive,' continued Richard feebly. "'I think he has a great deal of what people call magnetism. He's the kind of man who somehow makes you want to do what he wants you to. He seems a manly, straightforward sort, too so far as one can tell, and when he came to me with his scheme I was strongly inclined to go into it. But it is too big a gamble, and I can't, though I was sorry to disappoint him myself. He was perfectly cheerful about it, and so pleasant it made me feel small. I don't wonder at all that Cora likes him so much. Besides, he seems to understand her." Laura looked very grave. "'I think he does,' she said slowly. And then he's different, said Richard. He's more a man of the world than most of us here. She never saw anything just like him before, and she's seen us all her life. She likes change, of course. That's natural, he said gently. Poor Vilas says she wants a man to be different every day, and if he isn't, then she wants a different man every day. You've rather taken Ray Vilas under your wing, haven't you? asked Laura. "'Oh, no,' he answered deprecatingly. "'I only try to keep him with me so he'll stay away from downtown as much as possible.' "'Does he talk much of Cora?' "'All the time. There's no stopping him. I suppose he can't help it, because he thinks of nothing else.' "'Isn't that rather, rather queer for you?' "'Queer?' he repeated. "'No, I suppose not.' she laughed impatiently. And probably you don't think it's queer of you to sit here helplessly and let another man take your place. But I don't let him, Laura, he protested. No, he just does it. Well, he smiled, 
You must admit my efforts to supplant him haven't... It won't take any effort now, she said, rising quickly. Valentine Corliss came into their view upon the sidewalk in front, taking his departure. Seeing that they observed him, he lifted his hat to Laura and nodded a cordial good day to Lindley. Then he went on. Just before he reached the corner of the lot, he encountered upon the pavement a citizen of elderly and plain appearance, strolling with a grandchild. The two men met and passed, each upon his opposite way, without pausing and without salutation, and neither Richard nor Laura, whose eyes were upon the meeting, perceived that they had taken cognizance of each other. But one had asked a question, and the other had answered. Mr. Pryor spoke in a low monotone, with a rapidity as singular as the restrained but perceptible emphasis he put upon one word of his question. "'I got you in the park,' he said, and it is to be deduced that got was argot. "'You're not doing anything here, are you?' "'No,' answered Corliss, with condensed venom, his back already to the other. He fanned himself with his hat as he went on. Mr. Pryor strolled up the street with imperturbable benevolence. "'Your coast is cleared,' said Laura, "'since you wouldn't clear it yourself.' "'Wish me luck,' said Richard, as he left her. She nodded brightly. Before he disappeared, he looked back to her again, which profoundly surprised her, and smiled rather disconsolately, shaking his head as in prophecy of no very encouraging reception indoors. The manner of this glance recalled to Laura what his mother had once said of him. "'Richard is one of those sweet, helpless men that some women adore and others despise. They fall in love with the ones that despise them.' An ostentatious cough made her face about, being obviously designed to that effect, and she beheld her brother in the act of walking slowly across the yard with his back to her. He halted upon the border of her small garden of asters, regarded it anxiously, then spread his handkerchief upon the ground, knelt upon it, and with thoughtful care uprooted a few weeds which were beginning to sprout, and also such vagrant blades of grass as encroached upon the floral territory. He had the air of a virtuous man performing a good action which would never become known. Plainly he thought himself in solitude and all unobserved. It was a touching picture, pious and humble. Done into coloured glass, the kneeling boy and the asters, submerged in ardent sunshine, would have appropriately enriched a cathedral. Boyhood of St. Florus the Gardener. Laura heartlessly turned her back, and, affecting an interest in her sleeve, very soon experienced the sensation of being stared at with some poignancy from behind unchanged in attitude she unravelled an imaginary thread whereupon the cough reached her again shrill and loud its insistence not lacking in pathos she approached him driftingly no sign that he was aware came from the busied boy though he coughed again hollowly now a proof that he was an artist all right hedrick she said kindly i heard you the first time he looked up with utter incomprehension "'I'm afraid I've caught cold,' he said simply. "'I got a good many weeds out before breakfast, and the ground was damp.' Hedrick was of the new school. Everything direct, real, no striving for effect, no pressure on the stroke. He did his work. You could take it or leave it. "'You mustn't strain so, dear,' returned his sister, shaking her head. "'It won't last if you do. You see, this is only the first day.' Struck to the heart by so brutal a misconception, he put all his wrongs into one look, rose in manly dignity, picked up his handkerchief, and left her. Her eyes followed him, not without remorse. It was an exit which would have moved the bass violist of a theatre orchestra. Sighing, she went to her own room by way of the kitchen and the back stairs, and, having locked her door, brought the padlocked book from its hiding-place. I think I should not have played as I did an hour ago, she wrote. It stirs me too greatly, and I am afraid it makes me inclined to self-pity afterward, and I must never let myself feel that. 
if i once begin to feel sorry for myself but i will not no you are here in the world you exist you are that is the great thing to know and it must be enough for me it is i played to you i played just love to you all the yearning tenderness all the supreme kindness i want to give you isn't love really just glorified kindness no there is something more i feel it though i do not know how to say it but it was in my playing i played it and played it suddenly i felt that in my playing i had shouted it from the housetops that i had told the secret to all the world and everybody knew i stopped and for a moment it seemed to me that i was dying of shame but no one understood no one had even listened sometimes it seems to me that i am like cora that i am very deeply her sister in some things my heart goes all to you my revelation of it my release of it my outlet of it is all here in these pages except when i play as i did to-day and as i shall not play again and perhaps the writing keeps me quiet cora scatters her own releasings she is looking for the you she may never find and perhaps the penalty for scattering is never finding sometimes i think the seeking has reacted and that now she seeks only what will make her feel i hope she has not found it i am afraid of this new man not only for your sake dear i felt repelled by his glance at me the first time i saw him i did not like it i cannot say just why unless that it seemed too intimate i am afraid of him for her which is a queer sort of feeling because she has all laura's writing stopped there for that day interrupted by a hurried rapping upon the door and her mother's voice calling her with stress and urgency the opening of the door revealed mrs madison in a state of anxious perturbation and admitted the sound of loud weeping and agitated voices from below please go down implored the mother you can do more with her than i can she and your father have been having a terrible scene since richard went home laura hurried down to the library End of chapter 10chapter eleven of the flirt by booth tarkington this librivox recording is in the public domain oh come in laura cried her sister as laura appeared in the doorway don't stand there come in if you want to take part in a grand old family row with a furious and tear-stained face she was confronting her father who stood before her in a resolute attitude and a profuse perspiration shut the door shouted cora violently adding as laura obeyed do you want that little pest in here probably he's eavesdropping anyway but what difference does it make i don't care let him hear let anybody hear that wants to they can hear how i'm tortured if they like i didn't close my eyes last night and now i'm being tortured papa she stamped her foot are you going to take back that insult to me insult repeated her father in angry astonishment pshaw said laura laughing soothingly and coming to her you know that's nonsense cora kind old papa couldn't do that if he tried dear you know he never insulted anybody in his don't touch me screamed cora repulsing her listen if you've got to but let me alone he did too he did he knows what he said i do not he does he does cried cora he said that i was i was too much interested in mr corliss is that an insult the father demanded sharply it was the way he said it cora protested sobbing he meant something he didn't say he did he did he meant to insult me i did nothing of the kind shouted the old man i don't know what you're talking about i said i couldn't understand your getting so excited about the fellow's affairs and that you seemed to take a mighty sudden interest in him well what if i do she screamed haven't i a right to be interested in what i choose 
I've got to be interested in something, haven't I? You don't make life very interesting, do you? Do you think it's interesting to spend the summer in this horrible old house, with the paper falling off the walls, and our rotten old furniture that I work my hands off, trying to make look decent and can't, and every other girl I know at the seashore, with motor cars and motor boats, or getting a trip abroad and buying her clothes in Paris? What do you offer to interest me? The unfortunate man hung his head. I don't see what all this has to do with it. She seemed to leap at him. You don't? You don't? No, I don't. And I don't see why you're so crazy to please young Corliss about this business, unless you're infatuated with him. I had an idea, and I was pleased with it too, because Richard's a steady fellow, that you were just about engaged to Richard Lindley, and— "'Engaged!' she cried, repeating the word with bitter contempt. "'Engaged! You don't suppose I'll marry him unless I want to, do you? I will if it suits me, I won't if it suits me not to. Understand that. I don't consider myself engaged to anybody, and you needn't either. What on earth has that got to do with your keeping Richard Lindley from doing what Mr. Corliss wants him to?' I'm not keeping him from anything. He didn't say— He did, stormed Cora. He said he would if you went into it. He told me this afternoon, an hour ago. Now wait, said Madison. I talked this over with Richard two days ago. Cora stamped her foot again in frantic exasperation. I'm talking about this afternoon. Two days ago, he repeated doggedly and we came to the same conclusion. It won't do. He said he couldn't go into it unless he went over there to Italy, and saw for himself just what he was putting his money into. And Corliss had told him that it couldn't be done, that there wasn't time, and showed him a cablegram from his Italian partner, saying the secret had leaked out, and that they'd have to form the company in Naples, and sell the stock over there if it couldn't be done here within the next week. Corliss said he had to ask for an immediate answer, and so Richard told him no, yesterday. "'Oh, my God!' groaned Cora. "'What has that got to do with your going into it? You're not going to risk any money. I don't ask you to spend anything, do I? You haven't got it if I did. All Mr. Corliss wants is your name. Can't you give even that? What importance is it?' Well, if it isn't important, what difference does it make whether I give it or not? She flung up her arms as in despairing appeal for patience. It is important to him. Richard will do it if you will be secretary of the company. He promised me. Mr. Corliss told me your name was worth everything here, that men said downtown you could have been rich long ago if you hadn't been so square. Richard trusts you. He says you're the most trusted man in town. That's why I can't do it, he interrupted. No, her vehemence increased suddenly to its utmost. No, don't you say that, because it's a lie. That isn't the reason you won't do it. You won't do it because you think it would please me. You're afraid it might make me happy. Happy, happy, happy. She beat her breast and cast herself headlong upon the sofa, sobbing wildly. "'Don't come near me!' she screamed at Laura, and sprang to her feet again, dishevelled and frantic. "'Oh, Christ in heaven! Is there such a thing as happiness in this beast of a world? I want to leave it. I want to go away. I want so to die. Why can't I?' Why can't I, why can't I, oh God, why can't I die, why can't? Her passion culminated in a shriek. She gasped, was convulsed from head to foot for a dreadful moment, tore at the bosom of her dress with rigid bent fingers, swayed, then collapsed all at once. Laura caught her and got her upon the sofa. In the hall, Mrs. Madison could be heard running and screaming to Hedrick to go for the doctor. Next instant she burst into the room with brandy and camphor. "'I could only find these, the ammonia bottles empty,' she panted, and the miserable father started hatless for the drug store, a faint, choked wail from the stricken girl sounding in his ears. 
it's it's my heart mamma it was four blocks to the nearest pharmacy he made what haste he could in the great heat but to himself he seemed double his usual weight and the more he tried to hurry the less speed appeared obtainable from his heavy legs when he reached the place at last he found it crowded with noisy customers about the soda fountain and the clerks were stonily slow they seemed to know that they were already in eternity he got very short of breath on the way home he ceased to perspire and became unnaturally dry the air was aflame and the sun shot fire upon his bare head his feet inclined to strange disobediences he walked the last block waveringly a solemn hedrick met him at the door they've got her to bed announced the boy the doctor's up there take this ammonia up said madison huskily and sat down upon a lower step of the stairway with a jolt closing his eyes you sick too asked hedrick no run along with that ammonia it seemed to madison a long time that he sat there alone and he felt very dizzy once he tried to rise but had to give it up and remain sitting with his eyes shut at last he heard cora's door open and close and his wife and the doctor came slowly down the stairs mrs madison talking in the anxious yet relieved voice of one who leaves a sick-room wherein the physician pronounces progress encouraging and you're sure her heart trouble isn't organic she asked her heart is all right her companion assured her there's nothing serious the trouble is nervous i think you'll find she'll be better after a good sleep just keep her quiet hasn't she been in a state of considerable excitement yes she ah a little upset on account of opposition to a plan she'd formed perhaps well partly assented the mother i see he returned adding with some dryness i thought it just possible madison got to his feet and stepped down from the stairs for them to pass him he leaned heavily against the wall you think she's going to be all right sloane he asked with an effort no cause to worry returned the physician you can let her stay in bed to-day if she wants to but he broke off looking keenly at madison's face which was the colour of poppies hello what's up with you i'm all right oh you are retorted sloane with sarcasm sit down he commanded sit right where you are on the stairs here and having enforced the order took a stethoscope from his pocket get him a glass of water he said to hedrick who was at his elbow doctor exclaimed mrs madison he isn't going to be sick is he you don't think he's sick now i shouldn't call him very well answered the physician rather grimly placing his stethoscope upon madison's breast get his room ready for him she gave him a piteous look struck with fear then obeyed a gesture and ran flutteringly up the stairs i'm all right now panted madison drinking the water hedrick brought him you're not so darned all right said sloane coolly as he pocketed his stethoscope come let me help you up we're going to get you to bed there was an effort at protest but the physician had his way and the two ascended the stairs slowly sloane's arm around his new patient at cora's door the latter paused what's the matter i want said madison thickly i want to speak to cora we'll pass that up just now returned the other brusquely and led him on madison was almost helpless he murmured in a husky uncertain voice and suffered himself to be put to bed there the doctor worked with him cold applications were ordered laura was summoned from the other sick-bed hedrick sent flying with prescriptions then to telephone for a nurse the two women attempted questions at intervals but sloane replied with orders and kept them busy do you think i'm a, a pretty sick man sloane asked madison after a long silence speaking with difficulty oh you're sick all right the doctor conceded i 
I want to speak to Jenny. His wife rushed to the bed and knelt beside it. "'Don't you go confessing your sins,' said the doctor crossly. "'You're coming out of the woods all right, and you'll be sorry if you tell her too much. I'll begin a little flirtation with you, Miss Laura, if you please.' And he motioned to her to follow him into the hall. "'Your father is pretty sick,' he told her, "'and he may be sicker before we get him into shape again. But you needn't be worried right now. I think he's not in immediate danger.' He turned at the sound of Mrs. Madison's step behind him, and repeated to her what he had just said to Laura. "'I hope your husband didn't give himself away enough to be punished when we get him on his feet again,' he concluded cheerfully. She shook her head, tried to smile through tears, and, crossing the hall, entered Cora's room. She came back after a moment, and, rejoining the other two at her husband's bedside, found the sick man in a stertorous sleep. Presently the nurse arrived, and upon the physician's pointed intimation that there were too many people around, Laura went to Cora's room. She halted on the threshold in surprise. Cora was dressing. "'Mama says the doctor says he's all right,' said Cora lightly, "'and I'm feeling so much better myself I thought I'd put on something loose and go downstairs. I think there's more air down there." "'Papa isn't all right, dear,' said Laura, staring perplexedly at Cora's idea of something loose, an equipment inclusive of something particularly close. "'The doctor says he is very sick.' "'I don't believe it,' returned Cora promptly. "'Old Sloane never did know anything. Besides, Mama told me he said Papa isn't in any danger.' "'No immediate danger,' corrected Laura. "'And besides, Dr. Sloan said you were to stay in bed until tomorrow.' "'I can't help that,' Cora went on with her lacing impatiently. "'I'm not going to lie and stifle in this heat when I feel perfectly well again. Not for an old idiot like Sloan. He didn't even have sense enough to give me any medicine.' She laughed. "'Lucky thing he didn't. I'd have thrown it out of the window. Kick that slipper to me, will you, dear?" Laura knelt and put the slipper on her sister's foot. "'Cora, dear,' she said, "'you're just going to put on a negligee and go down and sit in the library, aren't you?' "'Laura!' The tone was more than impatient. "'I wish I could be let alone for five whole minutes some time in my life. Don't you think I've stood enough for one day? I can't bear to be questioned, questioned, questioned. What do you do it for? Don't you see I can't stand anything more? If you can't let me alone, I do wish you'd keep out of my room." Laura rose and went out, but as she left the door, Cora called after her with a rueful laugh. "'Laura, I know I'm a little devil!' Half an hour later, Laura, suffering because she had made no reply to this peace-offering, and wishing to atone, sought Cora downstairs and found no one. She decided that Cora must still be in her own room. She would go to her there. But as she passed the open front door, she saw Cora upon the sidewalk in front of the house. She wore a new and elaborate motoring costume, charmingly becoming, and was in the act of mounting to a seat beside Valentine Corliss in a long, powerful-looking white roadster automobile. The engine burst into staccato thunder, sobered down. The wheels began to move. Both Cora and Corliss were laughing, and there was an air of triumph about them. Cora's veil streamed and fluttered, and in a flash they were gone. Laura stared at the suddenly vacated space where they had been. At a thought she started. Then she rushed upstairs to her mother, who was sitting in the hall near her husband's door. Mama, whispered Laura, flinging herself upon her knees beside her. When Papa wanted to speak to you, was it a message to Cora? Yes, dear. He told me to tell her he was sorry he'd made her sick, and that if he got well he'd try to do what she asked him to. Laura nodded cheerfully. And he will get well, darling mother, she said as she rose. I'll come back in a minute and sit with you. 
Her return was not so quick as she promised, for she lay a long time weeping upon her pillow, whispering over and over, "'Oh, poor, poor papa! Oh, poor, poor Richard!' End of chapter 11